If you were to sail down the mighty St. Lawrence River, you might miss this little creek, but it's been a hotbed of scientific inquiry for the last 25 years. So we're at a place that's known locally as Rotary Creek. This was built in the 1990s. We constructed it to look like a natural creek. We can bring students here, sample the fish, and learn how the fish community evolves over time. Rotary Creek was designed to restore the native habitat along the St. Lawrence shoreline, but it's become home to some non-native residents too. So we've got two round gobies. Brown gobies, they're an exotic introduced species that were brought into the Great Lakes ecosystem in ship ballast water, and um, they're taking over many river bottoms. Round gobies are an invasive species, and this little fish represents a big problem up and down the St. Lawrence. The Great Lakes are one of the most heavily invaded areas in the world in terms of invasive species species that have been introduced by human activity to an area where they historically were not found. The St. Lawrence Corridor is sometimes also referred to as Highway H2O. Hundreds of ships travel to and from the Atlantic Ocean and the interior of North America every day, transporting millions of goods. Unfortunately, ships can also bring unwanted travelers. The round goby was introduced through ballast water. Large ships would come from Europe and Asia Essentially, they're scooping up water in another system, carrying it over and dumping it into the Great Lakes. Invasive species can disrupt nature's balance and threaten the lives of those that were already here. There's hundreds of species, essentially, that have been introduced to the Great Lakes area. In the St. Lawrence River, things like plants, invertebrates, all the way up to fish as well. All those affect the native species in some way, and they might not have any natural predators or, or any way to restrain their growth. Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire aujourd'hui? Aujourd'hui, Alexis, on va chansonner pour des, euh, des invertébrés aquatiques. So why and how are invasive species such a threat? These are questions that researchers are trying to answer. Just outside the River Institute headquarters is an inlet that just so happens to be a favorite foraging spot for round gobies. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est que maintenant, le gobie attachement fait partie de la chaîne alimentaire. Si on, on, on entend le, le dire « tu es ce que tu manges », je peux savoir qu'est-ce que le gobie a mangé. Je peux savoir il est où dans la chaîne alimentaire. Basically, we're trying to find out as much as we can about the round gobie's diet. We start with a little dance for data. Donc, j'avais besoin de bouger mes pieds pour faire bouger le sédiment. Comme ça, les invertébrés vont se relever du sédiment. Puis avec mon filet, je vais pouvoir venir passer. So we've taken care of the first part, seeing what choices are on the menu. Now we want to see what the gobies are actually eating. It's time to dissect a fish stomach. Je vais aller prendre le stomach avec une pince. Par ça, je dois ouvrir le stomach pour pouvoir aller prendre qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans le stomach. Puis je vais devoir être faire attention pour pas couper qu'est-ce qu'il y a à l'intérieur de l'estomac. Okay. Now to solve the mystery, what does a round goby eat? Qu'est-ce que j'ai trouvé, c'est qu'en général, le gobie va préférer euh, les gastropodes, donc les petits escargots qu'on trouve dans le fond. So, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, gobies aren't the only ones here who enjoy snacking on snails. Son épark, c'est qu'il peut compétitionner avec d'autres espèces natives de la région, comme par exemple la perchaude qui se nourrit euh, de proies similaires au gobie, puis compétitionne pour euh, les habitats. But there's more to it than that. Christina has discovered that gobies sometimes choose to eat different things depending on the water they're in. Donc mes recherches montrent qu'un changement euh, dans la conductivité, qui est une variable environnementale, peut modifier l'alimentation du gobie, qui peut avoir un effet, un impact sur la terre chaude. Conductivity is the measure of how quickly electricity flows through water, which in turn is based on the dissolved minerals, like salt and chlorine, in the water. 
l'impact écologique le plus important sur la perche haute, c'est quand le gobi euh, vit dans l'endroit à faible conductivité parce que c'est là qu'il est un spécialiste. Donc, il va euh, faire une pression quand même importante au niveau de la compétition pour les ressources pâtiques. Remember, gobies are not from here. They've had to adapt. So, where conductivity is higher, like in the Great Lakes, where water is similar to where their ancestors came from, they're less picky about what they eat. But in parts of the river where the conductivity is lower, they tend to stress out and eat more of those yummy snails that the perch also like. This also means that as the water changes, due to climate change, development, and other factors, this could impact the fight for food between the two species. Donc, n'importe quelle env euh, variable environnementale qui est modifiée à cause des changements climatiques peut avoir un effet potentiel, euh, un impact sur euh, les espèces natives de la région. Brown gobies aren't the only unwelcome newcomers making life difficult for local residents. These are some zero mussels right here. They stick to any surfaces, they'll be on propellers, rocks, sand bottoms. Members of the Mohawk Council of Akasasne have been monitoring the impact of the zebra mussels since their introduction in the 1980s. They're just like a mass spread of invasive species. You'll find them all over. People will come on their boats, their ships. They won't clean like the bottom of the ships, their propellers, and that's what causes the spread of zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are very, very common. There's trillions of them in the Great Lakes. They're about the size of your thumbnail. Zebra mussels are filter feeders. That means they feed on small organic particles in the water. They can filter up to a liter of water per day. So they're essentially filtering all the algae and nutrients out of the water, and they, they've created a very clear water condition, which is great if you're a scuba diver and you want to go see shipwrecks and things like that, but it's not great if you're an animal that needs to eat the same thing that zebra mussels are filtering. So, like the gobies, part of the issue is that they compete for food. But there's another potential problem. Because they're filter feeders, they gobble up contaminants in the water too. And that's not good for anything that might eat them, including sturgeon, one of the most culturally significant food sources for the Mohawk people. It's very concerning for our sturgeon since they're bottom feeders, so they'll often eat crayfish, small invertebrates, um, snails, as well as other mussels. We're concerned that if sturgeons start eating zebra mussels, if it's going to harm them. We still have a lot of questions about invasive species, but one thing we know is, whether we like it or not, round gobies and zebra mussels are here to stay. Some people feel that because they're an invasive species, if you catch them, you should kill them. I think it's too late, and I don't think that's really going to have much of an impact. As we search for answers, there's a growing sense of urgency, especially in a rapidly changing environment. Les impacts des espèces envahissantes sur les écosystèmes, comme par exemple réduire la biodiversité dans un milieu, peut rendre les écosystèmes plus vulnérables aux, aux effets des changements climatiques. But that doesn't mean it's too late to turn things around. We're just going to have to learn how to adapt to these new changes, as well as our aquatic ecosystems, which I think is just coming to be a slow start, but hopefully everything will learn to adapt. Je pense qu'on enseigne de plus en plus euh, qu'est-ce que sont les, les changements climatiques, quels sont les impacts des changements climatiques, quelles mesures, quelles actions on peut faire. Christina and Logan's work is part of taking action. The more we learn, the better prepared we can be for the changes to come. Je pense que les générations futures vont avoir des meilleurs outils, j'espère, pour, euh, pour essayer de comprendre mieux les changements climatiques puis mitiger les, leurs effets. <laughs>